Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner and this is Sustainable Hawaii, streaming live every Tuesday at noon at thinktechhawaii.com. You can join our conversation by tweeting at thinktechhi.com. We all live in a watershed in Hawaii and our daily lives rely on the eco-services provided by these watersheds. Native Hawaiians understood this. They forged the Ahupua'a system to care for the life-giving water and the land it nourished. But generations of poorly planned development in our state has imperiled this system and left us with serious water pollution issues, like the infamous Alawai Canal. My guest today, <coughs> Dr. Ken Kaneshiro, and recently retired Major General Daryl Wong, have created a foundation to tackle these issues head on. Dr. Kaneshiro is the director of the Center for Conservation Research and Training at the University of Hawaii. He is also well known as the founder of the Hawaii Conservation Alliance, which is a cooperative partnership of 25 government, education, and nonprofit organizations. HCA's mission is to promote effective, long-term management of Hawaii's native ecosystems through collaborative research, training, and outreach among land managers, scientists, educators, and the general public. Major General Retired Wong recently retired as the Adjutant General for the State of Hawaii, where he commanded the Army and Air National Guard, while also serving as the Head of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. He was also advisor to the Governor under that uh, aegis. He's currently Senior Advisor to the University of Hawaii Applied Research Lab and serves on the Board of Directors of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, which through its worldwide voyage has been focused on raising global awareness of the need to take care of our rivers and oceans. Welcome General Wong and Dr. Kaneshiro. Thanks we, for having us today. You two have been very busy. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> All the right reasons. Well, why don't we begin today by telling us about the new foundation you've created? Well, I guess it was about three years ago that um, I first met John Wong, actually, and he, you know, he was very concerned that his agency, the Hawaii National Guard at that time and Hawaii Civil Defense, really didn't have the kind of scientifically valid data information for him, his agency, to make the best informed decision in mitigating the impact of a flood, for example. And so he posed the question, how can we engage the broader community, but perhaps especially the K-12 community, in helping to collect those kinds of data that would, would help this agency uh, make better informed decisions. So that's how I got pulled into the, the discussion, and we've sort of joined uh, together in, in developing this, this new initiative, the Hawaii Exemplary State Initiative, and subsequently we formed a foundation to sort of um, build on that, uh, that concept. Now, I know that you've been working in trying to integrate K through 12 education ever since you started the NEON project in Hawaii. That's correct. And so, so how did you rope General, uh, Major General Wong into this conversation and work? Yeah, well, you know, so when he posed that question about how to engage the K to 12 community, then I suggested that we use the the, uh, the foundation that we had already developed in getting graduate students to mentor K-12 students and teachers in actually conducting scientific research um, and collecting data that's actually publishable in scientific journals. So, that, you know, I, I never thought as a, <clears throat> as a field researcher that I would get involved with K-12 science education, but that project, uh, which was funded by the National Science Foundation at that time, was probably the most successful project I've been involved with. It, kids collecting just information and data that's, that's um, uh, very relevant to the communities where the schools were located. So, you know, we wanted to take off on that foundation that we had built in, in engaging the university through the, um, the um, graduate students and the uh, K to 12 schools. Now, where is the data housed and how is it then accessed and utilized? Yeah, well, this is, right now we have portals. We've developed portals for each of the schools, you know, because they're not all doing the same kind of research. And uh, so the, the students at the various schools are able to enter their data into those portals and manage it uh, by themselves. Uh, we, we actually help to uh, maintain the portals and so on, but it's primarily the students and the teachers of those schools that contribute to that database, which we will have access to um, 
on an ongoing basis. And General basis. Wong, then how are your agencies that you uh, headed up in the past able to access that data and utilize it? Well, eventually they'll get all that data to use when they need to do uh, any type of uh, flood mitigation type work. But I think the, the thing is, it, you know, you ask how did, how does, how did I and, and Dr. Kanashiro get together? So as, as you look at it, it's a systems wide approach of looking at this thing. That, so the third person in this foundation is actually um, Dr. Kevin Montgomery. And he's another um, scientist, but he's more doing technology. So if you look at Ken, is more research side. And you wonder someone who's more on the operational side, how do we come together and continue? Well, it's, it's, the, it's the coming together of the needs of the community, the operational needs, and enlisting the science and the, and, the, and the kids, and then using technology. So it's the diversity of the three of us that really makes what we're doing uh, probably more different than anybody's ever done yeah. that. And I know that you've been working with Kevin Montgomery since we worked together, and he's from Stanford University. Right. So you're bringing in outside uh, resources and integrating the knowledge base there from Stanford here, and we're fertilizing Stanford's knowledge with our UH expertise. Right. Absolutely. So you can use indigenous knowledge, but we are in a world of science, so you leverage all of it to, to come up with a solution for the operational needs of the say the state government, city government, or even the local community. Yeah, being able to integrate traditional knowledge with 21st century modern technologies um, has, has, I think, revolutionized STEM education um, in, in our community. So tell me again the name of the foundation so we're all, we can all It's the Hawaii Exemplary State Foundation. Hawaii Exemplary State Foundation. I think we have your logo too, <laughs> which I thought was really a powerful logo. Yeah. Um, there it is on the screen. So the Hawaii Exemplary State Foundation is working with the schools, using the data. What else are you doing that we should be aware of there? So we... So again, the schools have done quite a bit in, you know, um, citizen scientists, or what do you call science that matters for these kids, and they're doing things that are very meaningful. The, um, some major hotels across the street are very interested because the Alawai will impact the economic viability of the state of Hawaii if it pollutes enough and pollutes the rest. So we've also went to the University of Hawaii Engineering Department, and there's also industry people outside that are willing to kokua. So again, it's really a statewide community approach to tackle a problem that can have large impact for the economy in the state of Hawaii. Well, for our viewers who may not be aware of all the issues at the Walla maybe you can uh, just recap a couple of the things that you're trying to solve there. Uh, a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a but, picture. I mean, okay. if, I think we have some slides that I'm going to show. So if, if we look at that first picture, uh, which is really a picture of some fishermen fishing for mullet in the Alawai Canal, believe it or not. And this was a picture taken in the early 50s. And so, you know, when I was a kid, I actually went with my dad to, to the Alawai Canal and learned how to mullet fish. Wow. Um, we used to go crabbing, and you could eat the crab. You could eat the fish <laughs> and the crab, and uh, it was not, not a problem. But since then, of course, um, the Alawai has become probably the most polluted water body in the state. And so the, the biggest issue is that how do we actually clean up the watershed so that it, it can all again become one of these multi-user recreational facility um, for, uh, for the community. And so <clears throat> the I think, I think you mentioned in your introduction that the traditional Hawaiian culture actually looked at watersheds from the top of the mountain down into the coral reef ecosystem. So, uh, you know, even though we're focused on the Alawai Canal and trying to clean up the, uh, this water body, we have to actually start our work at the headwaters of the Manoa and Palolo and Makiki streams, which all uh, empty into the Alawai Canal. So. The Alawai Canal project is actually General Wong's brainchild. I mean, he, he thought that this was a, um, you know, a, a situation in a, in a community where, you know, you've got the hotel, the tourist industry, you've got residential communities, you've got schools involved. And if we can really engage the entire community to help 
work on this and have ownership to this watershed. Yeah, you can uh, see the stakeholders that are involved in behind the golf course there. Right. There's hundreds of thousands of people who have a stake in how the water becomes polluted as well as using that water. Right, right. Yeah, so it's a very a good of, illustration. A lot of our kids train, you know, canoe paddling. I think um, uh, Olympic kayak teams had practiced there. But if it gets polluted, then people won't use it anymore. And uh, But the important thing is illustrating to the whole community that everyone's involvement is very important. So when Ken and I and, and, and Dr. Uh, Montgomery had a room full of people. Everyone yeah. sat there and there's where where do we interrelate with each other? So we didn't have a project. So the project I uh, saw so we just said we're gonna take the take on the Alawai. Which and that's is how very went. ambitious and very exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is very ambitious. <laughs> Particularly given the number of stakeholders we saw in that photo. Right. Well I mean if we go to the next photo I think it'll show you sort of the sort of a systems map of the stakeholders. Uh, that would be involved in this. So you've got academia all the way from the university to uh, the uh, K-12 schools. You've got the community with nonprofit organizations and so on. You've got private industry. You've got all of the government agencies. And so the Alawai Watershed Association, which has been, uh, I think has been incorporated in Hawaii maybe about 20 years ago, 15 to 20 years ago. And they've been working with all of these uh, community stakeholders in <coughs> Um, agreeing to work together and collaborating in restoring this watershed ecosystem. So where do you start? What are the first things that you're working on, the first steps to begin cleaning up the Alawai? Well, we need to really identify um, what all of this is. So there's things like invasive species. Um, if you go up to the headwaters, uh, the, the back of Banoa Valley, um, there's 150 acres that used to belong to the Catholic Church, the Paradise Park facility, so it's two 75-acre plots. And those two 75-acre plots, 150 total acres, are just stacked with albizio. Which is an invasive tree. Which is an invasive spe uh, tree, and it probably was the main reason for the flood that we had in October, you know, Halloween Eve 2004, which caused about $90 million damage and that most of it at the University of Hawaii. Because those are so fragile, they <coughs> toppled over and clogged the streams. Clogged the drainage and it came over the top and right. we had this big flood event. And so that's one of the things we need to really start to remove those kinds of invasive um, uh, species um, in order to begin to restore the native ecosystem. Because if you remove those, it not only removes the potential obstruction, but you can replace it with native plants that hold the soil right, better right. and reduce <clears throat> the soil erosion as well. Yep. And I would imagine that that also contributes, and I'm saying this because I learned it from you, Ken, that it also contributes to less invasive bugs and other things that disrupt all of the na native yep. species that would hold the watershed together. Yeah. You know, and, and the other thing is that, <clears throat> as we've been talking, um, we we're taking the system thinking approach so that whatever we do in this watershed, whatever component of it that we're doing, really does depend on other aspects um, of this ecosystem. For example, the removing the albizia, it's very expensive. Uh, we just uh, heard that um, the Alawai Watershed Association is trying to m remove one albizia tree which is about 125, 150 feet tall, and it's going to cost them twelve thousand dollars for one tree. Wow! Now, <clears throat> so and you know they got, they have to remove it and dispose of it, but if you collect and harvest those trees and use it for biomass to energy, right? The biochar and uh, we've talked we about talked that about before. Talked about the biochar and yeah. there's tremendous opportunities. So so many albizia. We need to take a break. But when we come back, we'll hear about what other steps are being taken to clean up the Alawai. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. 
Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kauilucas.com, and also on ThinkTech's. Hi, we're back with Major General Wong and Dr. Ken Kaneshiro, who are telling us about their very ambitious project <laughs> to clean up the Alawai. We're most indebted to you guys for taking this on. So we talked first about the Albizia and the importance of restoring native species. What are some of the other steps that need to be taken to begin to clear up the Alawai? So initially when we talked about, you know, there's three legs to this foundation. There's Kevin Montgomery, Dr. Kanishir, myself. So Kevin Montgomery is the te technologist. So the idea is putting in sensors in the rivers to measure not only fast moving water, which can show the community when they may need to get out of uh, their homes because the, the river is moving fast and high, but also to measure uh, bacteria in, in the water. So it'll come down the mountains and, and in, into the alawai. That way, as they make changes to say, what they use to uh, wash their cars or do things, you can measure the effect it has on the water that is coming into the ROI. So again, going back to data, going back to the community yeah. saying <coughs> that what you're doing is making a difference. Without that, they're, they're gonna say, I don't know if what I'm doing is changing is doing anything, but it w really will. But then those sensors will be owned by the middle schools or the high schools and those technology will be taught to those kids. And we we're kind of joking. So they'll manage those they'll manage sensors. Them. That's yeah. awesome. And that was your vision over 10 years ago when we, when we talked about the NEON project. Exactly. It's so wonderful to see it coming to fruition. Yeah, on our so, own. Yeah. yeah. So it's all interrelated <laughs> because, as Ken talked about, the albizia the trees is going to cause flooding. If we don't take care of the riverbanks and, and, yep. and everything else, so, you know, flooding and, and the emergency to that community. So they own those sensors. Those, I told them when I was a little kid, if, if I saw that in a river, I'd be throwing rocks at it. But if you, if you know that it's going to take care of your community, you're going to make sure that sensor is, is operating. Absolutely. Right. So how do some of the other um, constituents in that spaghetti chart that you have showing the system's approach to understanding the impacts on the Alawai? How do some other agencies or organizations, say, for example, the Manoa Community Organization or Milali'i, how do they get involved and what would their role be? Well, I get, you know, this, uh, we, we've been working with, uh, as I said, the Alawai Watershed Association, so, and we've sort of depended on that organization, which has been in operation for nearly two decade, uh, uh, decades, uh, to bring to the table the partnerships that they've already developed established with these uh, stakeholders. But at the same time, General Wong and I have been meeting with DLNR. You know, I, I had a meeting with the Department of Health. Army Corps. Uh, Army Corps is involved uh, and so on. So we are engaging as many of these stakeholders that have either responsibility, regulatory responsibility or some um, uh, management responsibility in, in the watershed. And the DLNR, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, uh, a couple years ago now, uh, executed that wonderful program, Rain Follows the Forest for Watershed Management for right. Oahu. Um, is that coming into play in terms of using that plan to educate the K through 12? I think DLNR has quite a, a growing and strengthened educational outreach program, right? And are you utilizing that? To, to reach out? Whatever tools are out there and curriculum that's out there, we will take advantage of rather than trying to you know, start from scratch. But the idea, I think the, the most important idea is that we want to get the kids out there conducting actual research that's valid for scientific publication. So that's why the mentorship by the graduate students is so important. You know, many of the teachers, you know, they, they, have a science, they may have a science background, but conducting research by themselves without some kind of mentorship by real scientists uh, that's being trained in science, scientific research is difficult. <clears throat> and so by having, all, 
it was incredible when we had the GK12 project that was funded, funded by the National Science Foundation, how, how many teachers were knocking on our door. Can we have a graduate student you know, to help us with uh, these kinds of research projects? So th yeah, that g getting the kids involved and actually conducting scientific research as part of their STEM education curriculum mm -hmm. is critical to this project. So one of the component people might not understand is uh, so Ruth Gates, who's an uh, expert in yeah. coral. Actually, she's going to be on the show again in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. as we work up to the conservation, World Conservation Congress. Yeah. So uh, my relationship with Ruth Gates, and, and going back to your original statement, so just to make a correction, I'm not on the board of the Polynesian Warrior Society, but I know and I have been friends for many years, and I've gone on a voyage in uh, Australia with him oh, wow. and in New York. Uh, and that's where Ruth Gates and I know and, and some others, we dove the Great Barrier Reef. So part of the water, the Alawai, look, is we can measure it with technology, but the true measure of life and the period of water is the coral. So we will add coral also in the look of, from the mountain all the way to the ocean. So yesterday we were at a symposium and Mrs. Mm -hmm. Avi made a statement which really took, I think caught both of us and we thought it was very, it was very important to so say, you cannot disconnect the forest from the ocean. Absolutely. And we, so we, as Ruth Gates spoke there, then she talked about the coral is, is kind of the, the forest in the ocean. So the forest in the mountain, all the way to the forest underwater needs to be connected. And that's the only way we're gonna have a true ecosystem restoration of this watershed. Right. So we're including quite a bit of things, but everyone is very interested. So if I wanted to get involved, do you have a website that you're establishing or do I have to work through the schools? We are planning to develop a website. Okay. We're in the very early stages of our organization. Um, we haven't gotten any funding yet, but we're anticipating significant funding to really take this uh, and complete this project, but more than just doing it for Hawaii uh, and just for the Hawaii community, but just take it across the other um, uh, Ahupua in the state, but also use it as a model for other watersheds globally. Absolutely. So there's there's already interest. I mean, General Wong has, um, um, in in while he was the um, adjutant general, National Guard had uh, connections with uh, the uh, uh, government in Bali, and they have actually agreed to take two of their streams and watersheds and apply whatever we've been doing in the Alawai, apply it there. That's wonderful. Are you going to get an opportunity to share all this at the World Conservation Congress? No. I think we need to share this show with folks as they come. We'll have to talk about how to do that because certainly <laughs> this is something that should be yeah. shared widely. I know and, and as we wind down our time, I want to make sure we also talk about your other exciting and important project about mosquito vectors. Can you tell us about that? Right. In fact, that's, that's the reason why the Alawai watershed got superseded. <laughs> um, the, I, about a year ago, or a little more than a year ago, I got a call from the IUCN, uh, one of the um, program directors there, the uh, Species Survival Commission director, um, and he gave me a call from Switzerland asking me, do I think we could eradicate mosquitoes from the state of Hawaii for the purpose of uh, you know, reducing or the impact of avian malaria? For the native birds, you know, of course, you know that we've lost many of our native bird species due to avian malaria and avian pox. And so I, I'm, you know, I'm not a mosquito expert, so I sort of put it in the back of my mind and I spoke to my uh, mosquito colleagues and there was some interest, but not overwhelming so. And now, I'm, of course, the whole concern over Zika makes exactly, it even more pertinent. Exactly. That's what happened. So when that happened, and I got a call then from Senator Brian Schatz's office asking me exactly the same question from the perspective of Zika and dengue and these human diseases. And at the same time, about a week or so later, we got an interest from the Asian Development Bank in the Philippines about how we might be able to address mosquito issues more broadly, not just in Hawaii. So the, the pressure was on us taking a systems thinking approach that which is our foundation um, in addressing vector-borne diseases that like Zika and, and um, dengue. So I, in a matter of a couple of months, I pulled together maybe 40 um, experts, mosquito experts globally, to agree to come to Hawaii to discuss the feasibility of 
eradicating mosquitoes from the state of Hawaii using, again, the systems thinking approach. So it's, it's going to be pretty exciting. So it's going to be held during the Congress, uh, September 6th and 7th on the Big Island. And in fact, the mayor, Mayor Kinoe's office, actually committed to funding the, the workshop. Terrific. So, so that's on the 6th and 7th. Is that all, are the participants also participants in the World Conservation Congress, or they're a, coming just for this? A few of them are already mm -hmm. coming for the Congress, but the rest of them are actually coming just for, just for this. the workshop. That's very exciting. And it's, and it's going to be a series of workshops. It's, you know, we're not going to be able to do it in a two-day workshop, come up with a effective strategic solution for addressing So if someone boxes. of our audience wanted to get involved in that, how would they get connected? <clears throat> At the moment, it's not an open meeting. You know, we wanted to keep it small so that we can have more effective discussion. But as I said, it's going to be a series of discussions, um, meetings, and workshops. But I think as we approach the, the uh, maybe the third or fourth workshop, where <clears throat> we'll be able to put up, a, develop, and establish a strategic plan, is when we'll have a sort of an open meeting so that other people in the community can actually begin to hear about uh, what our plans are. Well, I'm sure you're going to be very successful at drawing money to this endeavor. Yeah, there's, and perhaps there's as a, a lot secondary. of interest. There's a lot of yeah, interest. Yeah, because it's such a huge concern for the world right now. Right. Um, I'm wondering, Major General Wong, uh, as you move forward, are you going to be continuing these educational opportunities? Um, you, you seem to be a man of many seasons. Mm -hmm. As we close, <laughs> Give us a peek into your future. You know, I think Ken and I have kind of committed ourselves to uh, not the ROI, but this concept of of, a, um, of true how do how do you solve uh, problems with systems approach thinking. So I think you know I, I'm doing several things. You know, one is the applied research lab, really helping influence cyber and critical infrastructure protection. But I think this is going to be. I mean, I can't speak for Ken, but I think we've talked. This is going to be our life's work. Uh, we'll do this till we're dirt. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I hope you don't. I hope you hang on for a while. <laughs> we really appreciate all that you're both contributing to Hawaii's well-being and our sustainability. And I hope our audience will join us next Tuesday at noon at Sustainable Hawaii at ThinkTechHawaii.com. Okay.